Um, and um, so the International Committee on Open Vitalist Science is our organising committee for these events. Um, we have now 12 members and we cover the whole globe. Um, we meet regularly to have discussions and work on different aspects together. Um, our goal is to increase the knowledge of and implementation of open science practices in vitalist research. And we have lots of different initiatives we're doing. So as well as training, we have the Fair Vitalist Project, which I'm going to talk about in a minute because uh, it's related to our topic today. We also have a project on uh, developing a vitalist ontology, which was what the last session of this training was about. Um, and um, we also have our initiative on training, uh, which is why we're here today. Um, I just quickly, our code of conduct, we are going to have some discussions at the end of today's session. So please just make sure that um, you are very respectful to each other um, and that you just have a very positive attitude to collaborating today and having discussions. Um, if you feel that there's been anything that's been inappropriate, please do contact me. Um, my email address is there or you can private message me in the chat because we do not want anything like that to happen. And I'm very happy to remove people from this particular Zoom room um, if they have been inappropriate in any way. OK, so today we are here to um, think about and learn about FAIR data. Um, I'm putting the slide up here again about the live translation. So again, if you haven't selected the right button for the language you want to hear, please go to the bottom of your Zoom window and um, select the globe button and then the language that you want, Spanish, English or Chinese are all on offer. So what we're going to do today is we are here to, um, I'm going to be and the rest of the speakers are going to be explaining to you about what the FAIR data principles are. Um, and we're also going to be demonstrating the use of them, giving some examples. So we've got Jean-Marie, who's going to be talking about the image database that he is involved in. We heard a bit about that in the last one when Francis gave a talk. So this talk is going to be very specific about how the FAIR data principles are implemented in this particular database. We're also going to hear about Gabby's work, which is very specific to Phytolith reference collections so, um, and FAIR data. So she's going to talk about that. Um, so hopefully by the end of today's session, you will actually understand more about the FAIR data principles and you'll understand how that this is actually um, examples of in five. Um, so we're going to start today by having a talk uh, about introducing the FAIR data principles. Also, the project that we have been doing on the FAIR, uh, called the FAIR Vitalist Project. So I'm going to present some results of that project and also um, some recommendations that we are giving out um, of a sort of way forward for our community. Then we're going to have the talks by Jean-Marie and Gabby, which are our kind of demonstrations of FAIR data in action. And then our sort of exercise at the end is going to be a discussion really about the ways forward to move towards um, a Phytolith, uh, FAIR Phytolith guidelines. So we're going to discuss, have a discussion of that um, and maybe use the breakout rooms if we have time for that. So I'm just going to move a bit more slowly. Um, so starting with um, what FAIR is. Um, so um, the FAIR data principles are considered um, the gold standard for data management and stewardship. Um, sorry, I can see my people there. Um, stewardship and are being implemented across many different disciplines. So FAIR actually stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, and the, the guide, these principles are currently a large focus and drive towards, um, there's a drive towards using the FAIR principles, particularly in um, European funded projects at the moment, or funded research. So the FAIR principles were developed um, for data management but they are actually now used for many different purposes. So there are principles that have been deferred principles developed for sharing software, educational materials, and also um, physical samples. Um, it's a set of simple principles, but its implementation can actually take uh, a bit of time and must really be considered separately by each discipline, as it can't really be applied in exactly the same way for every discipline. So it really requires community engagement to discuss the issues around data sharing and how to move forward in a fair manner. Um, it does not mean that your data has to be open. 
but the aim is to increase the long-term reusability of the data. Um, they can be used very broadly to improve the transparent sharing of research. So the FAIR data, uh, FAIR data is about making all of the information about data openly available. So really the metadata is what's really important. And metadata is the data about the data uh, or information about the data. So providing the data with very rich metadata means that another researcher can understand what data was collected, what methods were used, where the data can or could be accessed from, um, and what standards and vocabularies um, have been used and how the data can or could be reused. So to give you an analogy to explain the FAIR principles, I'm going to use food cans to represent data. So for this picture of the cans on the left, um, who, who knows what is inside these cans? How would you know where to find them in a supermarket or how the food inside could be used? So really, you can't know that from these cans. They don't have any labels on them. And so the labels on the outside of food cans are important to help us find the products we want. So this is what is meant by findable. The labels and information also helps to improve the accessibility of the products. So you can find the right products on the right shelves because you know their name, because it's written on them. The labels also um, often contain information about ingredients inside the cans and how the food can be combined with others. To, uh, to cook our favourite recipes. So this is really about interoperability, so using it for different purposes um, and in different ways. So um, data also needs all of this information provided about it so that we can find it, we can access it, make it usable with other data and understand it fully so we, can, we are able to reuse it. So a common misconception about the FAIR principles is that the data has to be open. And this actually isn't the case. Um, FAIR data doesn't, does not mean data has to be open. Um, FAIR data is about all the information about the data being openly available. So it's the metadata that does really have to be open. Um, and in order, and this is really is in order to give researchers information about the data so that they can determine if they want to use the data and how it can be accessed and how they could actually reuse it. Um, but we do really want to encourage more open sharing of data, if you can. So you often hear the statement as open as possible, as closed as necessary, when there are conversations about open data. And this is due to the fact that sometimes it is not possible to make data open because it's too sensitive. Um, for example, in archaeology, there are concerns about openly sharing data about human remains or the geographic location of some sites um, due to concerns about grave robbing and thefts of antiquities. Um, there are also considerations about who owns the data we produce. So this could be, for example, in commercial contracts where the data is not owned by the specialist that does the work on it, um, or when working on materials that is culturally sensitive and may in fact be owned by indigenous groups. So there are another set of standards um, that I want to point you towards, which are called the care principles which um, have been developed for thinking about the use of indigenous data, but can be applied more generally to all data. And um, they can be used in combination with the FAIR principles. And it's important to consider these responsible research aspects when thinking about depositing data openly. Um, there's also hesitancy concerning open data in terms of researcher ownership of data and ideas. And this is often linked to concerns uh, around scooping um, this is hopefully something that um, we can address through training in our community about how to deposit data using appropriate licenses and also by promoting the benefits that open data will bring to our community and you personally as researchers. So we can use the care principles to evaluate how openly we can share data and then we use the FAIR principles um, to make our data as accessible and understandable as possible, even if it can't be openly shared. Um, but um, if we, I just want to say at the end here, if, if data can't be open, um, we should still be archiving it in long-term repositories. And this is, very, this is very important. And you can do this in a restricted manner. And I think a lot of people don't understand that. So that's something that um, I really want you to get from today's training. Um, we can actually put our data there in a restricted way and we can use the FAIR principles to make that data very understandable um, and have very clear processes that you can use to apply for use of that data. 
So I'm going to go into just explaining in more detail um, about the different parts of the FAIR um, data principles. And first of all is findable, because it's the first letter. So this means that you want your data and particularly the metadata to be findable on an online catalog, data catalog, and uh, it could be an archive portal, database repository, any online platform. Um, and what's important, it needs to be findable by humans and machines. So this has to do with the information that you put with the data, so the metadata. And I've put here another little note, the DOI, which is what's really important, because that actually gives it a permanent place. And we did run a session on repositories. And one thing we highlighted in that session was that um, some things, some online um, uh, databases or repositories, they're called repositories, but they are not long term archiving repositories because they don't give you the digital object identifier. So when you do deposit your data, that's one of the things you need to look for so that you have this particular reference number that you can then use to reference your data. And it's a permanent place so people can then find it. So if you look at the bottom of the slide here, it's talking about having standardized and rich metadata. So when you put your data into a, into a data repositories, you're going to be put, you're going to have a login which is going to be linked to you and other people. So you're saying who is the author of this data. You're saying how it was created. So you're linking to some procedures or protocols on there. You're also having how it can be accessed. So you're saying that it's either openly licensed or something like that or restricted. You're providing specific keywords with the data. So for Phytalist, we would want to put a keyword Phytalist on there. We'd want to put maybe a geographic region. We might want to put something like um, the age range. If it's archaeological data, you might want to put the actual archaeological age of the data. Um, and it's really good to put as many keywords as possible on there. Um, and then um, when talking about the data, um, where the data uh, comes from and uh, when it was created, so the date that it's actually created and different versions of it you might actually have on that. So the next one is about accessible. So how do we make it accessible? So again, really, it's through using repositories, having this permanent place, but it's about those repositories being, you're being able to access them. So then by a normal sort of search engine on a, on a uh, web, some sort of web browser. So if you typed in the name of your data set, it should be able to come up quite easily on a web search. Um, <laughs> excuse me. There also needs to be very clear instructions for it to be accessed. Now that's really easy if it's an open data set, because essentially you can just click a button and you can download the file. Um, when it is a restricted data set, it's important that you have a clear instruction. So it, that might be provided by the actual repository itself, or it might be something that you might have to have specifically written into um, your uh, description so that people understand how they can get that data. Um, also, um, I'm going to see, do I need to keep in my Yeah, so it's also important that any information that you put with the data is kept uh, up to date all of the time. And that's probably another thing that people uh, often don't understand about um, depositing your data. You can actually go back and re-edit the metadata to go with your data. Um, and you can actually just keep doing that. I don't, in most repositories there, it doesn't seem to be any restriction. It's actually just the changing of the data itself, the data files, that would mean it would create a whole new um, uh, DOI for that. So uh, metadata can be updated. Um, and the last point here um, is about sort of what sort of data you put on um, repositories. So actually you can just put your raw data on there, but actually the best practice is to put the different sets of data on there. So you might have a raw data set, you might have a cleaned data set, you might even have another data set which you're using for analysis. So you can actually put different types of data sets on there and say, uh, explain what each of them is very clearly and how they're different. So um, findable and accessible, I always think of as the, the slightly easier parts of the FAIR principles. When we get into the interoperability and the reusability, this is where it does become a bit more difficult. We have to give a bit more effort. So interoperability is where we're thinking about the data set that we're depositing, 
Can it be used? How is someone going to use that with another data set? So this really comes back to having um, controlled vocabulary. So last in our last session, we talked about ontologies and standard vocabularies. So explaining the terms that are used within the um, within the data set. Um, one thing that you can use is a data dictionary where you can actually write another, it's like another spreadsheet, another um, uh, bit of information that really explains all of the different columns in your data set. And that's really useful for people to be able to understand it. Um, it's also important that all these, all your data sets are put on in a particular format. So for normal, for normal, if you're using Excel, you would put it on in a CSV file uh, format. Um, but there are obviously other file formats you can use. Um, and the third point here is really important. It needs to be a standalone data set. So it does need to have this very rich information with it, rich metadata, so that anyone could take that data set, the extra information, and then start to be able to understand and use that data set. And then the bottom one also, it's important that the information with your data set is readable by code. So that means actually and the data set itself, it means that you need to have it in a file format that can be used directly by a machine. Um, and the last one then is reusable. And this one, the first part of it is fairly easy, is that you've got to give it a license so people understand how they can reuse it. So there, we've covered licenses actually in another session, the using repository session, so go back and see that video. Um, and then again, you need to understand the provenance of the data. So where is that data come from? Um, there needs to be information about um, uh, other information you can link out to that is related to it. So that might be, it might be articles, it might be code, it might be protocols that you've used. They don't necessarily have to be on the same repository, but you can link out to those. Um, and then it's very important that you to describe this relationship between the different levels of data that you are providing. So I said you could have the raw data, you could have a clean data set. You must say how these relate to each other. So you must document that and provide that information with your data set. So I just want to do a little bit of an aside. I find this really interesting to this slide. So this, the last few slides, I took them from a FAIR hackathon that I went to, which was part of an EOSC Life um, project. And um, these, um, one of the words is, is data provenance. And it was quite a new word to me, but I think it's really appropriate for thinking about our data. And it means like, where has this data come from? And then the data life cycle, is like, how has that data been created? What is the life of, of your data set? So if you think about this, this is something that we need to capture as it is happening. If you were to think about it at the very end of a project, it would be very hard to think about all the different things that you've done to that data set. So this is something I think we need to get into the habit of actually capturing while we are doing our research. So thinking about writing quite clear documentation around how the data, how the samples were, essentially made? How was it collected, the data? How we did some sort of data quality checks on it? How we were processing the data to maybe clean the data for our analysis stage? And then thinking about how we're archiving and publishing it. So it's a whole life cycle, the data, and actually we need to think about documenting that very thoroughly. Um, and that will help us to deposit our data in a, in a fair manner. So um, if we start to think about Phytalis in particular, um, um, one of the um, projects that we have been doing over the last few years is the FAIR Phytalis project. And what we were thinking about really is about Phytalis data, is Phytalis data FAIR? So we thought about two particular questions. Um, so where is Phytalis research in respect to the FAIR data principles? So what's kind of happening if we compare our data that's out there to the FAIR data principles? Um, and also the second question then, once we've discovered that, how do we apply the FAIR data principles specifically to Phytalis data? Because as I said at the beginning, um, it's not always straightforward. We have to think about things quite specifically to different disciplines because the types of data are different. So um, that really um, has to be understood and thought about. So what we went about doing is we went about um, having a community survey, which we did um, to find out what uh, the Phytalis communities 
opinions were on particularly open research. It was a bit wider than fair, actually. And what was going, what they thought was going on with their data and their publishing. We've done a fair assessment, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and we are starting to develop a proposal for the fair data guidelines. So the fair assessment um, was where we started to look at where Fightless data was, how it was being published, what it kind of looked like um, at the moment. So how we went about this is we obviously had to find out where the data is. So it's mostly all in articles. So we selected uh, 100 articles, so 50 from two particular regions. And um, we started to do a bit of data collection. I'm going to talk in, in a minute about the um, questions that we had. Um, and then um, we're at the stage at the moment, we've just written a data paper, which is just about to be published. And we're actually using that data now to write up a summary of the data and um, to propose some recommendations, which I'm just going to kind of talk through in a way. Um, so the questions we thought about, um, to kind of ask of, of, of the, these articles is sort of general information about the paper, so who wrote them, what they were about, um, the sort of time frame of the of the studies, um, where geographically the study was. Um, we wanted information about the open if it was open access the articles and the data, um, how the methods in the papers were communicated. Uh, lots of information about the data, so where it was, what the type of data was that was published. We also wanted to know about the pictures that were included, so the photos uh, for identification purposes in the articles, and also we wanted to learn a bit about the software that was used for analysis. You can see all of our data collection forms. We have a GitHub repository that's linked here, so you can see everything that we've done in this particular study. So as I said, we had 100 articles. We chose two good geographic regions because we felt that Europe and South America had two particular traditions of doing phytolith research. So we thought we would actually gather quite a wide um, spectrum of different types of data. So that's why we chose these particular regions. We chose 50 articles from each. So out of those 100 articles, they actually came from 50 different journals, which is a very wide range of journals. And this actually points to, I think, one of the problems with um, uh, trying to implement the fair data principles in FITELESS is that actually we've got, we can't target one specific journal to say, try and encourage people to put their data into repositories because there's more than one journal that we publish in, there's loads of journals. Um, so that's something we do as a community have to think about, I think. Um, we found that all these articles, so most were from the quaternary period, some were also from the modern, um, modern studies. Um, and we had a small, small number that were from older studies. And then the types of studies that the, these, um, this research was about was um, mostly archaeological, paleoecological, or a combination of both of those, and some methodological, and then fewer of the other types of um, research that's done in fight of this. So you can just see I made a quick uh, little pie chart. You can see most is archaeological studies, but we've got some methodological and some paleo. There. Um, so in terms of like open access of these articles, it was about 50% that were, or just over 50% that were closed access. Um, and um, we had some, uh, mostly the open access were the paid type, so gold or bronze open access. And um, what we did find is that there's very little use of green open access. So that's something we really want to say is that um, green open access is free. So if you can't afford the, green, the gold open access, um, please make sure that you put your articles out somewhere in a repository for free so people can see them. And that is allowed with most um, journals. So um, it's a good idea to do that, to make your research open for everybody. Um, and then we looked at the method, so how people were communicating how they collected their data. And obviously this is really important to understand the data set. So um, we did find that a lot of the methods that were reported in articles weren't very clear. So um, some articles did actually not include any method at all. We had quite a lot that included multiple references to methods. And actually it was quite unclear for us to understand how um, they actually collected the data. Because if you're uh, referencing several different methods of extracting phytolith from sediment, we, nobody would be able to then uh, reproduce that if they were trying to reproduce that method themselves. 
Um, we actually were thinking about the counting method as well, or whether it was clear, whether we would be able to replicate it. And again, just over half we thought were probably not replicable because it just wasn't quite clear to us exactly how people had counted on, on the FICOLA slides. Um, people did do really good descriptions of the instruments that they used. So we found that was to be about very clear to be about 80% of those articles. And then we wanted to understand the use of the, the nomenclature. So our standard vocabulary, because that's really important for the interoperability of data sets. And we actually found that it was about 57% of um, articles were using one of the standard nomenclatures that we have in Phytalis. Um, and then we looked a bit deeper at this. We actually investigated if they were using it um, in the sort of fullest way it could be used. So particularly thinking about describing uh, our morphotypes that are not, in our, uh, not described fully in the um, nomenclatures. So we did actually find that there is a problem with people using it fully. So either they were mixing up some of the terms between the two different standard vocabularies, or they weren't actually using the process for describing um, the new types of morphotypes um, in, the, in the way that you're meant to with these standard uh, vocabularies. So in terms of the data, um, I think this is the most stark finding that we found that only 2% of the data uh, was in a repository with a DOI. So remember with the FAIR principles, that's one of the key things is that the data needs to be put in a place where you can find it. So essentially we have found that a lot of the data can't be found, a lot of the raw data. Um, so the reposit repositories that were used were a university repositories and also Mendeley data, which is a repository that is um, one of the publishers, um, Elsevier's um, repository. Um, the types of data also that were being published, there was actually very little raw data. Most of the data was process data um, that was being published with articles. And the file formats, well, you would, you would expect with the finding that most of these are not in repositories. The file formats are things like um, actual PDFs or, or Word documents, um, or really just a table that is within the uh, article. So, um, so those are like our main findings. I would say the, the actual numbers in there, they are provisional numbers, so don't take them as completely set in stone. That's our initial sort of um, uh, adding up of all we, what we found. Um, so what we want to think about really is like, where do we go from here? What changes could we make to our data publishing and archiving to kind of move towards being a more fair discipline in terms of our data? What things can we do now that would be easy for us to do? So like simple quick fixes to make things uh, more accessible for us uh, and what things are going to take much longer to implement um, and also for that much longer sort of harder thing what do we need to do to get there to get over any barriers that might be there so this is where I'm, we're sort of starting to propose some things that we could do moving forward so in terms of findability we have found that the data is really hard to find so you know I think that's a fairly quick fix we can put things in repositories. There's lots of free repositories that we can use. So we can start to really move towards putting our data sets into a long-term archiving repositories. I mean, even better, we can publish lots of open metadata to go with it. And then even better, we could think about publishing data papers to really have our data sets explained really nicely. In terms of accessibility, um, our data is quite inaccessible, where at the moment our data is in these articles, we found that over half of those are closed access, so it's very hard then to see the data if it's in an article that is not accessible, if you, unless you have to pay for it. Um, so that's quite difficult, so again it's about putting our data into open repositories, also publishing our articles as openly as we can, so maybe taking advantage of the green open access, which is free, putting our our preprints into um, uh, repositories um, and also linking out to other outputs as well so that all of our, our data and the different aspects of our research is actually fully linked together. Um, and then in terms of interoperability, we did find that there was this, this uh, um, sort of improvement in using the um, standard vocabularies, which is really great. Um, but there was a bit of consistency, problems with consistency in using the nomenclature. So, um, you know, we 
we think we actually had someone talking about the nomenclature in our uh, last session. Uh, and I think that was really important to have Luke there to talk about what they are doing, to explain it a bit more fully and to talk about the developments that they are going on to do. Um, and that's something that we need to continue working at is sort of educating our community in the use of the standard vocabulary. Um, we've also been starting to develop an ontology, which is going to help with linking together different um, standard vocabularies that are used. Um, and then also we need to kind of think about using this very rich metadata to understand the terminology. So we can actually put um, more um, information into articles in with our data that we deposit about how we've named the different um, fight lists in our data sets. And then lastly, um, about reusability. So really all these things kind of adding up that we're not putting our data into repositories um, means they haven't got a license on them. So we can't actually understand how to reuse them. Um, and then also things like um, the um, uh, adding, not having the extra documentation that you would have if you actually had a raw data set in, in a repository. So that all adds up to things, which means that a lot of our data is not reusable. Um, I mean, that is in the sense that if you went to talk to a colleague and work with them on their data set, they would explain all that information to you. So this is reusability in a sort of standalone reusability way. Um, so this is something that we need to work, definitely work towards, but is much harder. I totally understand that. So what we need to kind of be working towards is this very rich metadata that goes with our data sets, having our data sets in very usable formats. Um, we just our data sets are quite small, so CSV files that were from our Excel spreadsheets uh, is all fine. Um, and yeah, using a repository so you can openly license or you know license your data so that people can understand how they can actually reuse it. So um, the last thing I'm going to say, because I feel like I've been talking too long, um, is what should the FAIR data guidelines include for FITALIS research? So these are the key points that we have found in our FAIR assessment, and there's lots of them here. But how, how much of this do we need at the moment? How much, I want to sort of raise the question, how much of this, how much is too much? Because we want it to be a usable guide and we want it to be something that people can start implementing. So that's kind of the discussion that I want for us to have at the end today is to really think about um, how much do we need to include at the moment? Is it sort of a guideline that evolves over a, a number of years? Um, what do we want to be included at the moment? Um, and that's all I'm going to say. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing.